nine. Oh, hey. Oh, yeah. you did I that. I mean, we started that early. That, yes, you did. You pulled that I just got, side. I couldn't wait. And I couldn't right, wait I to start. <laughs> Calling Chris <laughs> Anderson. If this is Sunday, it must be Aldborn. I don't know. Where no are you? No close. We are at the Donington Valley in lovely downtown Newbury, which is near Aldborn. Okay, and, fair uh, enough. finished that up today. Yep. Fair so, and Colin Rickbeyer, you look like you're back in Chicago. I am back in Chicago. Which is you. Before the nuts. Only the, it's only the, you're only the third most corrupt city in America. I just read a news article that Illinois is only the third most corrupt state. <sighs> I imagine another mind. state that I uh, have close associations with, Rhode Island, is probably uh, one of the top Nipping two. at their heels? Well, I, no, I imagine that they're one or two. I, 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 they're a very corrupt place as well. So let's, uh, you know, we can, if George Luz is here, he can give us an update on Rhode I'll Island's corruption, et cetera. Uh, welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Chris and I are traveling the globe. Uh, but still somehow we managed to drag ourselves in front of the cameras uh, to be here and to interview some great guests uh, and talk about history every Sunday. And today we're going to be talking about interrogating high-ranking Nazi prisoners in Washington, D.C. during World War II, so that should be good. And hey, Chris, a big thank you, uh, as always, to everyone supporting this effort via Patreon. Absolutely. Especially our top-shelf supporters Absolutely. who are listed here. Is your name on this list? If not, either we've made a mistake or you're not a top shelf supporter. So you can become one by uh, going to patreon.com slash history happy hour. And of course, you can find out about upcoming shows on our website, historyhappyhour.net. Chris, who's with us? Anybody watching this show today? Yeah, well, Xavier. So our Spanish contingent is oh, with so us. We so we got Spain good. in the house. And uh, yep, uh, Lizzie Borden. So hello, Lizzie. I Skip see we got Cornette. Two. Okay, Tony from South Philly. So we have South yeah. Philly in the house, Florida with Danny. Doreen is back, so she must not be on stage, so that's good. Okay, uh, Sun City, Arizona, where it's 111 degrees mm. Fahrenheit right now. Um, and and here's Frank, who says that our guest today was one of the most effective chief historians of the National Park Service. So we've already got a, you know people uh, people praising our guest, and he hasn't even started talking yet. Oh, really? Well, he, he, yeah, he talked <laughs> yeah. to us before the show. I mean, it's not like he's keeping quiet. Okay, stop, Rick. Okay, yeah. Chris, are we are we ready? I think please, I think we please are. Please tell yes. me we're ready to move on to some actual yes. content. Yes. Give me the cue. <laughs> Open. The bar is open. And Chris, before we start our interview today, I, I know you're on a Band of Brothers tour. And of course, the last surviving member of Easy Company, uh, Bradford Freeman, died a week ago today. Uh, and you have been connected to the guys in this unit a long time. And I'm sure this is a milestone that you never wanted to reach. No, it's, um, you know, you always expect it uh, in one sense, but it, it's still a blow. Um, they're such a huge part of my life, and I guess, um, as as my wife has told me when I get upset about these things, she said they will continue to be a huge part of your life, and there will not be a day that will go by that I will not think of them in some way. And um, so, in a way, being on a Band of Brothers tour not too long after getting this news is, is good for me and, and good to talk about them. And um, yeah, yeah. A, good, a good kind of way to remember him as you, you travel the route that they traveled uh, yeah. during World War II. So um, well, I'm sorry for that loss. I certainly know how it feels uh, being very close to so many of the Ghost Army soldiers who have uh, uh, passed away. We have so few left, so um, it's, a, it's a tough thing. Uh, but um, yeah. as you say, it's not unexpected, but that doesn't make it a whole lot easier. So uh, our condolences to you. Uh, to Mr. Freeman and his family, and um, we will try to remember. We'll do our best. All right, so we will try to make a transition from that to our topic today, which is also a pretty serious topic. Uh, during World War II, a top-secret installation 15 miles from the White House conducted intelligence and espionage operations kept secret for more than 50 years. Uh, uh, the facility at Fort Hunt was known 
only by its code name, P.O. Box 1142. Um, and here, something like 15 German generals, thousands of other high-value Nazi prisoners were bugged and questioned by American interrogators, many of them who themselves were German-born Jews. So this was a very well-guarded secret for decades, and the details might have been lost to us but for the efforts of the National Park Service historians. And now the former chief historian for the Park Service, Robert Sutton, has written a book uh, telling you know another little-known tale from the annals of World War II. It's called Nazis on the Potomac, which is such a fabulous title. I have to say that the moment uh, that I heard that title, Chris, I wanted gotcha. to have that book. On gotcha. it. I didn't even know what it was about at that point, uh, Bob, but I knew that I wanted to have the book on the show. And the subtitle is The Top Secret Intelligence Operation That Helped Win World War II. So, Bob Sutton, welcome to History Happy Hour. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, let me also pass along my condolences. I've, I've had to deal with a lot of folks I've known who were in World War II who were gone. So I, I have a sense of how you feel. So again, let me pass my condolences on to you. Well, um, in, uh, in, uh, in World War II, Fort Hunt is a POW camp, but it's not very similar to the Luftstalags we see in the movies or the other POW camps in the U.S. It kind of resembles them a little bit, as you can see in the photo, in that it has barbed wire and uh, guard towers. But this place is really different. Tell us a little bit about what was going on here, just as context for getting us started off. There were there were three programs at Fort Hunt, um, and as you mentioned, it wasn't known as Fort Hunt at, at the time. It was called P.O. Box 1142 for the post office box where they got their mail in Alexandria. <clears throat> but it was um, it had three programs uh, that functioned at Fort Hunt. One was a program that was that intel that um, gathered intelligence with interrogations of, of German prisoners and also listening in on their conversations. Um, they, they bugged their rooms, they had microphones, hidden microphones all around the fort, and so they listened in on conversations um, around the fort. So that was one program, uh, interrogation and eavesdropping. Uh, a second one was they, there was a, a program that capped MIRS, uh, Mili Military Intelligence Research Section, uh, they translated and interpreted and then wrote reports on tons, literally tons, of captured German documents. And some of the most valuable um, uh, books that were published that helped the, the Allies win the war came out of this program. And a third program, which was completely different from these two, um, was uh, Escape and Evasion. And it had, it had several functions. First of all, um, they, they would develop, they had developed a cryptology um, system where they could communicate with, with soldiers who were in German uh, POW camps. Uh, it was very successful. Um, it it uh, worked pretty flawlessly throughout the war. Um, so that was one thing. They, would, they, would, they could easily communicate with, um, with soldiers from Fort Hunt to, um, to these uh, camps. Uh, they would do it through writing letters, and the the person who was in charge of this program, Silvio Silvio Bedini, who later became very well known as a historian at the Smithsonian, um, he developed a system, and he said the most important thing was to get soldiers who wrote terrible were terrible writers. Um, he said you can you can get make terrible writers better writers, but you can't make good writers into terrible writers. Very interesting thing. But anyway, they communicated back and forth. And then they sent packages to um, to the POW camps, things like um, transmitters that were in baseballs, transmitters that were in uh, cribbage boards, maps that were in like Mo Monopoly, uh, were hidden in Monopoly boards and so forth. Uh, so that was one program. Another program was that they developed uh, they developed a whole system for downed pilots so that hopefully when they were downed, they could escape um, capture. So they had, um, you know, they had water um, purifying pills, they had maps, they had different things that hopefully would help them escape. So those were the three pro th programs at uh, Fort Hunt. And so these, uh, these all fell under the auspices of what was called the Military Intelligence Research Service, correct? That's correct. Right, and did this, 
service exist before the war, or was this a wartime creation? It, well, it sort of existed, um, but it was the, the um, well, the, the actual names were MIS, Military Intelligence Section Y, and Military Intelligence Section X, and the other one was Military Intelligence Research Section. But they, they okay, did exist, okay. they did have intelligence before the war, but these were developed um, primarily uh, for World War II, and they were very different from, from earlier um, efforts. One thing, one thing that was very that was fascinating to me about this about the program, the um, uh, interrogation and eavesdropping program, there was a, a lot of concern among the hierarchy and the government that eavesdropping was just wrong. You know, you you just there's the secretary Stimson said you just don't read gentlemen's letters. Read mail, right? Yeah. You know that one, and so yeah. <laughs> there was some concern about it, but. Uh, they decided, you know, this was this was something that was very important, and they should do it, and that was that. Um, so that was that was something that was very very different from earlier efforts. Okay. Well, they were Nazis, so it's okay to bug the Nazis. <laughs> well, what, okay. you know, I'm sorry, it, it was okay to bug the Nazis, but um, there's pretty good evidence that the Nazis had a sense that they were being bugged. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So. Mm. The army felt like this was really a terrific thing, you know, getting um, surveillance on on the Nazis. But some of the people who were actually stationed there, who did the interrogations and did the eavesdropping, felt like the interrogations were far, far, far more successful than the, than the eavesdropping. Uh, you know, uh, I wondered about what, in terms of, uh, of interrogation and eavesdropping, what kind of techniques were used and, and how much did this owe to a similar British initiative that they did with high-ranking Nazi prisoners that uh, Helen Fry has detailed in some of her books and has talked about here uh, on History Happy Hour as well. Was it kind of like uh, linked to that or, or completely unrelated or what was the connection there? Well, that's a that's an interesting part of the story. Um, the 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 army sent a team over to um, over to England, over to UK, um, in 1941, and they they looked at everything. Spent several months actually analyzing every single phase of the whole how the uh, the British dealt with. Uh, with German prisoners, primarily German prisoners. And so they, a lot of the things that they learned uh, were very similar because they they tried to copy a lot of the things that the, that the British had done. One thing that was different was the, the um, cryptology program. Um, Silvio Bedini looked at the British system. He felt it was far too complicated because it had a lot of math in it. And he said he never had passed a math <laughs> class in his life. So he he had the, he he wanted to modify that um, for his use, but other you know there were some things that were different, but mostly they they tried to copy the British system, and one of the things that the, that the British did was they had um, what they call them cages. I can't remember the term uh, where they had their where they all around um, England some of these um, castles and and estates. That's where they interrogated Germans, and so and so they were they. Originally, we're thinking of doing that um, here, um, but they decided Fort Hunt was far better than any of the possible places that they looked at. So, it was was there uh, was there coordination between British and American intelligence, or once it got very, set up, very much they so. kind of okay, okay, very much so. In fact, the the uh, the whole the MIRS the the document section, there was actually a much larger um, office in UK. That got the initial packages of um, of documents of captured documents, right, okay. and so they looked at them, and then they sent most of them to Fort Hunt. It was actually a smaller group, but the, but Fort Hunt was the one that actually produced most of the reports from World War II. It, it's good to hear that there's II. that there's coordination because there's so it seems like so many examples where where the Americans basically said, uh, "Oh, we, we don't care about how you've been doing it." Britons, we know better, and we're going to do things our own way, or yeah. we're going to learn it from the ground up. So it's it's good to to know that there's something that kind of um, you know offers the other side of the story. There's well, no there was some of that. Correct. There was some of that too. I think I think what the Ameri you know this whole M I R S M I S X the uh, you know, escape and evasion. I think they 
they carried that a little further than the British. Now, that one thing they did, the British sent packages from bogus um, companies, right? And the Americans did that. So they right. that was similar. Um, but they got they they got a little bit more brazen with what they sent. Is this the Americans? Can I can I, can I right. uh, we we'll get back to the interrogation in a moment. And Chris, you you have a question due, but I, I'm just jumping in on this. Um, famous uh, famously, um, uh, they made monopoly sets that had uh, stuff hidden inside uh, some of the pieces. Uh, 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 that were sent to prisoners. Is this the kind of thing that went from the escape and evasion people over to yes. American prisoners in Germany? Yes. So what they what they did at the beginning, um, there actually was a book written. Uh, I didn't. I, I just had a, a a short chapter on that because there was a book written by a fellow who was who was actually in that program, um, Schumacher. Right. Um, called uh the escape factory and actually he wrote the book when he wasn't supposed to but in the 1990s um, right yeah that's a whole different that's a whole separate story but um he said that what at the beginning the um their their commander um sent them out to buy everything they could think of to see what they could use to hide different materials in and they found that um that something initially they thought these these game boards were not good because they were made out of cardboard, but then they realized that they could actually take them apart <laughs> and put, glue them back together and put all kinds of things in them. So uh, they just, it was just trial and error. What, you know, they just tried to find what seemed to work well. And there's a whole, I don't, I didn't get into it, but there holds, there's whole separate stories about how companies would develop these transmitters that could be hidden in baseballs and in cribbage boards. And that's, I mean, there's there's a, there's a whole series of things. Most of the companies that develop these things did it essentially um, gratis. You know, they didn't yeah. look to make any money from it. So Bob, I think one of the obviously one of the parts of the story that was fascinating to me, and I'm sure fascinating to a lot of other people, um, is where the soldiers that worked at Fort Hunt came from, what their background was. Um, could you describe? They're a pretty unique set of characters that you. That you talk about in the book, and so maybe you know talk about who was working in this organization, um, and your you know your involvement with them, and and that that part of the story. Yes, most of the not most of the actually soldiers that we that we interviewed, uh, many of them came from Germany or Austria when they were children. They were from Jewish families, and they came from uh, mostly from Germany, but some from Austria during the 1930s. And part of the reason that we, <laughs> that we were able to interview them, they were they were fairly young when they were at Fort Hunt. So they were still, yeah. many of them were still alive. We did most of our oral history from uh, 2006 to 2010. So most of these fellows are still alive, but some of their stories are just, just incredible. Um, this one, there's there are a couple that this really, really appealed to me. One young fellow's name was Rudy Pins, Rudolf Pins. He was raised in Germany, and most of these had exactly the same story. When they were young, they said there was no, they didn't really have any sense of anti-Semitism in Germany or Austria when they were young. But um, he, you know, as he got a little older, he, he fi finally hit him when he went, he went to a Catholic school, and one day the teacher called him in and said, uh, you need to see the principal, and the principal said, well, I'm sorry, but you can't go on a field trip this weekend because you're Jewish. And that's when it really hit him. His parents had arranged for him to go into a program. It was called the Thousand Thousand um, uh, Children. Actually, there were more than that. Uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a government program, but the government sanctioned it, where Jewish groups would raise money in the United States to help children uh, come. They they had to be uh, between the ages of about ten and sixteen. Is this like the uh, Kinder Transport? Well, I, there was the Kinder Transport went to England. This was a very yeah. similar thing that came to okay. uh, the U.S. But anyway, he came. He went. To, he uh, his parents arranged for him to come to the United States. He lived with a foster family in Cleveland, um, and he he continued to communicate with his family. But in um, when the war started, he didn't hear or anything from his family, and and that was it. That was the end of it. Mm -hmm. So that was one story. Um, I think one of the most fascinating stories in this period, there's, there was a fellow named, um, oh gosh, sorry, I'm just drawing a blank here. Um, 
I'll try to, I'll find his name here in a minute, but he, he um, uh, went to school one day and his, his uh, teacher says, again, same thing, said, you need to go see the, see the principal. And he went to see the principal and the principal said, um, you can't go to school anymore. He said, why not? Because you're Jewish. Well, the interesting thing here was that he had no idea that his family had been Jewish. They had converted before he was born to Christianity. Um, he, they never told him that, that he had a Jewish background. So it was a double whammy for him because he thought he was as Christian as anybody, um, which, he, which he was, but because his family had been Jewish, he was told he could no longer go to school. Um, and so that was another story. And then there's some stories like some people, some were able to escape, just barely get out of Germany, um, you know, at the last minute before the Nazis attacked. Um, so their stories are, are, I mean, just, just that I actually had a whole chapter on, uh, I call it escape from the Nazis, a whole chapter on this section, uh, which I think is just, is, is really an interesting regard story. But when at, at the beginning of the war, some of these folks were really interested in joining the army because they wanted to get even with Hitler. So one, one person, his name was Paul Fairbrook, who's become a very good friend of mine. Um, and I talk about him frequently. He was in the military intelligence research section. He and his family left Germany, went to Palestine, and then um, eventually made their way to, um, to the Netherlands and then to the United States. When the war started, he, like the next day, went to try to join the Marines, and he was told he couldn't. He tried to join the Navy. He couldn't. He tried to join the Army. He couldn't. Well, it Because he's out, German. Presumably. He's German. I'm right. sorry. Yes, I, I didn't make that. Yeah, he no, was. No, no, you did. But I mean, that's why. That's why I, I'm, I'm presuming that's so, why they wouldn't let him join. Right. He was an in, enemy alien, which meant that he could. Oh, he was neither an enemy. He was an alien, but he certainly wasn't an enemy. So he couldn't join, and that was true of many of these um, folks who were at Fort Hunt early Very on. They couldn't enemy. join, but before long, they decided that the army decided. You know what? that's silly we should we should let them in and then they started then they started to not only let them join but they started um drafting them into the army but many of them when they when wherever they were assigned they heard their german accent and they said you know you're are you german did you are you from germany and they, yes well immediately they either sent them to fort hunt or in many cases more cases to fort camp ritchie which was a, a major uh, intelligence training center. Um, some of them came to Fort Hunt. A majority of them went to Europe to inter interrogate um, German prisoners in Europe. But um, they, most of them immediately um, got uh, American citizenship shortly after they were in the military. I but was, uh, it turned okay. out that this was a, this, I'm sorry. Yes. And you were asking. I, I no, no, you go, go ahead. ahead. Rick's not that important. Finish. You're much more no, important. No, you're the guest. You're the guest. You get priority. So I'll just hide back um, here. Well, part of I mean this this turned out to be a just a just a, an amazing coup for the army because not only did they was German their native tongue, but they understood the nuances of the German language. They understood the nuances of German culture. They could communicate with these guys. One one um, person that I've gotten acquainted with, he was not at Fort Hunt, but he was at Camp Ritchie, and then he went to um, went to Europe. Um, Guy Stern, he said that he had tremendous success interrogating German prisoners because he loved soccer, and most Americans at that time didn't know a thing about soccer, but he did, and so he had an easy time communicating with the Germans because he knew about soccer. Uh, well, I was going to say that the... Um I was going to ask about the Camp Ritchie connection. Is I'm sure a lot of people have seen the 60 Minutes piece on the Ritchie boys, uh, and you know there's a lot of overlap with this story, right? Because some of the, you know, as you say, many of the people who who came to Camp Ritchie and trained in intelligence and were, you know, German Jews, German speaking, they went to Europe. But some of them end up being part of this uh, story at Fort Hunt, Virginia. Somebody asked us where Fort Hunt is. It's pretty near to Mount Vernon. Um, 
And so uh, uh, there really is a strong overlap, isn't there? So that's, I'm going to ask a two-part question. I never do this, but that's part one. And part two, ah, I know, I'm just, I'm just trying to keep you off the, off the questioning, Chris. <laughs> part two is, you know, it must have been really hard uh, for somebody who was Jewish, whose family had been persecuted, perhaps eradicated by the Germans, to start chumming up with these high value prisoners and, you know, making nice and interrogating them in these sort of I'm trying to be your friend kind of ways. I, that's a, that, that strikes me as really challenging. It was. And, you know, the, the, you mentioned Camp Ritchie and I probably should say a little bit about that. Um, they, one of the, one of the major training programs at Camp Ritchie was training soldiers how to interrogate Germans and what they would do is they would have um, American German soldiers dress up as Germans and do everything they could to trip up these um, these German American uh, potential interrogators. And there's one story that I think is really hilarious. Um, it's a uh, the Germans had a term for a field kitchen called a um, a, cana a goulash canon. Goulash is a is a um, actually Hungarian, but the German became very popular in Germany. It's a you know like a beef um, stew, and a can a canon is a cannon, and it's a crazy you know it's a crazy idiom, and if you don't know it, it's very you know it can be frustrating. Well, this this uh, German who was posing as a German Nazi started talking about a. Um, goulash canon and the poor guy who was trying to interrogate him got more and more and more frustrated and eventually they had the goulash going down the mountain and the you know just well the, so what they would do is they do everything they could to trip them up and some of them actually just couldn't do it and about 40 percent of them washed out so they had but they as you said that they they were it was kind of tough because they had to sort of swallow what they thought of these folks when they were interrogating them and most of them uh, when when they were asked that question most of the folks that we in, that we interviewed when they were asked that question they said you know i looked at them that they were doing their job as i was doing my job and once you could do that and you realize that if you were in the field you were going to try to kill them and they were going to try to kill you but now you were trying to get information from them um, it just made things not necessarily easier but made it more palatable so, Bob, speaking of, of these Nazis, um, walk us through how does a German find himself at, at, at Fort Hunt? I mean, what, what's the process that takes this guy from wherever he's captured and, and, and he winds up in Fort Hunt, Virginia? And also, what sort of Germans are they interrogating? There were, there were, uh, we call them high, some look at it high ranking. That's not necessarily the case. It's more like high value Germans. Um, some, uh, many of them actually were enlisted men, but um, what they would do, that what the, what the allies would do is generally when these folks were kept, well, actually there's, there's two different sets here. Let me, let me back up here. Most of the early prisoners that came through Fort Hunt were from captured or sunk u-boats and so early on most of these were sailors and so uh they they were you know taken from if, if they survived from the u-boat they can't many of them came through fort hunt and that's they were interrogated and then they it fort hunt was not really a pow camp it's very important that distinction it was uh interrogation center and generally they were there for a period of time and then sent on to a pow camp so early on most of them were, were from u-boats but as the war progressed, as the Americans were more and more involved in the war, many of these these um, interrogators who were in uh, in Europe in in uh, when a German when German soldiers were captured, they in most cases were just sent to POW camps. But there might be something that the that the the military would see had value. So. For example, there was one soldier they captured who had been on the Eastern Front. And so they sent him to Fort Hunt. And it turned out he, he had very valuable information because they really didn't know much about, they didn't know a great deal about what was going on on the Eastern Front. So he was, I believe, a corporal, but 
because he had been there and the information that he had, especially about like Russian tanks as opposed to German tanks and so forth and how the Russians were treating German prisoners and how the Germans were treating Russian prisoners and so forth, <clears throat> was very valuable information. Uh, and so when they found someone like this, they would send them to Fort Hunt. Usually there, there, was a, there were several layers of processing before they got to Fort Hunt. So in many cases, their initial interrogation would be in Europe they were sent to a place in Pennsylvania called Pine um, Pine Forest or Pine Furnace, Pine Furnace in Pennsylvania. It's, it was a, had been a CCC camp. They were sent there initially, and that's where they were vetted even further to determine whether they would be valuable to send to Fort Hunt or not. And part of the thing at Fort Hunt, they just, they couldn't accommodate a huge number of prisoners, so they had to go through this process to decide which ones were more valuable than others. Okay. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, this is a story that, as you write in the book, you say that it, it could have been lost to history, uh, or at least the details of it. I, I don't think that we normally think of the National Park Service as an institution that is uncovering secret World War II history. So what is the story of how uh, the National Park Service was, was instrumental in bringing the details of this to light? Because it's kind of an, an intriguing tale. Well, first of all, <clears throat> there's um, this, um, Schumacher wrote this book in 1990 called The Escape Factory. So uh, <laughs> the Army tried to buy up all the copies of it because they didn't want the story to be told then. But <laughs> By about the middle 90s, by about the middle 1990s, most of the world, most of the World War II documents were declassified. And so a lot of these, most of the interrogations that were in the National Archives were now available um, for scholars. So around a few years later, around uh, late 1990s, uh, early 2000, the Park Service had a, one of the things that we do is called a historic resource study. And they, they hired a historian to do a historic resource study of um, Fort Hunt. And he went through the whole history of the fort. You know, it started, it actually was has an interesting history. It was actually part of um, George Washington's river plantation initially. And he talked about that. And then, but then he, he actually began to look at some of these documents of interrogations that were now available. And so the Park Service began to learn a lot more about the story as these um, documents became available. But the one thing they had, they did not have at the time, they didn't know of any soldiers who were stationed there who they could interview who would give them information about Fort Hunt during World War II. So, um, this, that that part of the story, I think, is is great, a, a wonderful little little side piece here. So, they would the, the, uh, Fort Hunt is a big picnic area on the George Washington Parkway, <clears throat> and occasionally the uh, park rangers would give tours of Fort Hunt. There was a coast artillery fort with these great big huge um, concrete batteries, and they talk about the history and go through the whole history of sort of from the beginning, and then they'd start to talk about what happened during World War II. And, and at the end of that part of the talk, they'd say, you know, we really would love to find people who were stationed here during World War II so that we can find out more about what happened. <clears throat> so one of, the, one of these tours, a woman perked up and said, you know, my former neighbor was here during World War II. He didn't say much about it, but I know he was here. And um, he's, he, I know he's still alive. I think he's moved from here to Lexington, Kentucky, and um, he might be willing to talk to you. So one of the historians in the park, um, Brandon Bice, um, got in touch with this fellow because he, this woman had his information, asked to interview him, said, you know, he could, he could now talk about the story. Um, he was very hesitant. In fact, they had to cancel the trip several times. Finally, he agreed to an oral history interview. So Brandon went to Kentucky. Um, actually, in his in his briefcase, he carried several of the interrogations that this fellow had done with his name on them. Right. Um, his name was um, Fred Michelle. So he got there, showed him showed him that you know he could now talk about the story, and he started talking, told the whole story. But more valuable than that, he asked 
uh, Brandon asked him if he could name any other folks who were stationed there. So he gave him several names. And eventually they got a, a roster of the folks that were there. They started going through the roster, the names that Fred, Michelle, and others had provided. And by the end of this process, <clears throat> by about 2010, they had interviewed um, about 65 of the folks wow. who were stationed at Fort Hunt. Wow, that's a great, uh, that's fabulous to, to preserve that. So, uh, Rick, I, I had a question, but maybe uh, I saw Frank ask the question. You want to take Frank's question? question? Yeah, just because what I want to ask after Frank kind of takes us away from this direction. So let's so put this up here. So, uh, Bob, this is uh, from one of our viewers. And Chris, Watch most just... of our shows, so we want to make sure we get... What? No, you're, you I were freeze? frozen for a moment, but you're back. Oh, Okay. So uh, anyway, so Frank watches all of our shows, and, and so he has this question. Uh, was there ever an occasion when the information obtained through interrogation was patently false or deliberately designed to mislead the interrogators? That's a very good question, and I'm, <laughs> I'm absolutely sure that that was the case. Um, but I don't know of a specific example of that, unfortunately. Right. I, I mean, I just, I, of course, yes, but, yeah. um, but I don't know of specific examples. Um, <clears throat> one thing I do know, though, is that they were, they treated these prisoners very, very well. And most of the folks that we interviewed, and of course, my, most of my story is based on fairly late history um, of Fort Hunt. Most of the folks we interviewed um, told us that toward the end of the war, the, the, German prisoners that they interrogated and listened to with eavesdropping um, were the, pretty clear that the war was going to end and they wanted, if they were going to be on one side or the other, they, that, you know, there's going to be a war with Russia. So they wanted to be, they wanted to be as cooperative as they could be. Right. So that is mostly what makes up the story because that was the information that I had available. But mm -hmm. to answer the question, I'm sure there was. And, and one of the things that was very useful for the um, eavesdropping program was they had, they, early on they had ger many Germans who were very dissatisfied with, with the Nazi regime and they made it very clear that they'd be happy to do anything they could to help. They became what, was, what the, what the uh, fellows at Fort Hunt referred to as stool pigeons or SPs. And they would room with German prisoners and do everything they could to get information from them, um, either in the rooms or around the fort. Uh, and this was a tremendously valuable asset to have these uh, stool pigeons help out with the interrogations. Well, and actually, I, I just want to pick up on that then, because that later on, that was another question. That was a pretty risky uh, proposition for some of these stool pigeons. Could you tell us a little bit about Werner Dreschler? Because he was a stool pigeon that it, it didn't really turn out so well for him. Yes, he probably was the star of the um, of the SPs. Uh, the army promised that he'd be fine, he'd be safe. They accidentally sent him to when he was finished with as a stool pigeon. They, I don't know how I don't know how this happened. Of course, the army didn't say. Sometimes they don't say they made a mistake. <laughs> really. <laughs> Yeah, really. They accidentally sent him to Papago Park, which was one of the major. There's actually an interesting story there too. But where many of the of the um, U-boat prisoners were, Papago Park in Phoenix, uh, POW camp. Um, the the sailors from his from his U-boat actually were there. They recognized him. Uh, they had a kangaroo court, and they killed him. And this is just one of the real tragic, horrible stories that I think comes out of World War II. Yeah. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, what we have. So, so this is in operation, and, and, and we'll talk about this a little later because it continues after World War II is over. Is there a good example of intelligence gathered here that was materially useful 
in the war effort, right? So there's a big effort going on. We're interrogating a lot of people. I think we said that 15 German generals cycle through here, mm -hmm. thousands of other German soldiers. They're being eavesdropped. They're being taken on field trips to Washington, D.C. They're, they're doing all sorts of stuff to kind of get on their side and get information. So, so do we have any idea what we got out of it? Well, most of the generals that were interrogated, not all, but many came after the war. Um, they, and they had you know, a lot of useful information after the war, but um, they, yes, they got, they got a lot of information, good information. Um, let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, one thing that they discovered, uh, that, the, that the Allies discovered, was that they would have bump, bombing missions on um, railroad um, terminals, right? They would, they would bomb them because they wanted to take out the materials that were being loaded on the trains. They wanted to take out the trains. And so they started bombing um, railroad terminals um, around Germany. But after a bombing run, uh, the trains were running as if nothing had happened. So one of the pieces of information that they got was that the Germans were starting to um, starting to load and unload on crossings, railroad crossings because you know roads would cross there obviously uh and they could take the trains there they were all over germany so it just made perfect sense uh so they would load and unload at, at crossings and that's why the trains were running as if nothing had happened well as soon as this information was passed on to the allies um they um started started looking for all of these um uh crossings now and started bombing and they had more success well that's one thing Another thing was that the Germans, uh, their their uh, submarine um, areas where they kept their submarines had covers. They they would cover these these nests. What do they call them? Nests, I think. Uh, they would cover them, and so the the Allies, especially in Hamburg, would bomb the areas that were supposedly the covers over the over the um, submarines. Uh, and then the submarines would start running as if nothing happened. Well, they found out that the Nazis had been tricky in that they put wooden covers further out to look like this is where the, the pin was, where they were keeping the, the submarines. Instead, they were in a concrete area further, further in. And as soon as they found that out, again, they had much more success um, bombing the, um, the submarine pins. One thing that was unfortunate, um, two men overheard a conversation between two German soldiers talking about uh, Pian Pianamunde, where the, where the rockets were being developed. And they had not been fired yet. They passed that information on. And for whatever reason, apparently it never got to the, to the higher ups that needed to get the information. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, the, the rocket program, the German rocket program continued um, who knows what would have happened um, if the information would have, it, it could have changed things, but that was one thing that that um, was problematic. They heard about it, but for whatever reason, it didn't apparently get to the, the higher ups. But on the other hand, um, the, the Americans and the allies, uh, the, the Americans and the British were absolutely determined to try to find all of the plans and everything connected to the rocket system um, they found out through interrogation that a, a miner, a German miner, could direct them to a salt mine where all these plans were kept. And mm -hmm. they found they, they got there before the before the Russians did and got all the plans. So that so there were that's just a couple of examples of some of the things that they found. So, Bob, one of the aspects of the book that I found the most interesting, because, you know, I'd been sort of familiar with the, the interrogation techniques and. Um, uh, some of the escapes are from having Helen on the show to talk about that from the British perspective. But one of the things I found really fascinating were the color books. So can you tell us what the color books were and kind of a little bit more about that aspect of the operation? Because I think it's a seemingly mundane but very important part of what was going on. Yeah, the color books. Um, the most important of the color books was the Red Book. Um, and it had a very interesting... Uh, I was. You know why it was called the Red Book? Because it had a red cover. <laughs> that was hard. Right. It's a normal simple. reason. <laughs> <laughs> really hard, right? Uh, this was the, the Order of Battle of the German Army, and it had three different, prim primarily three versions 
Uh, the most important probably was 1944 version. Um, what it did was it listed every single German uh, organization down to the division level. And it would say, you know, where it was, where it had been, who the commander was, who the chief of staff was, um, what their primary duty was. Uh, so that was one incredibly valuable thing. So they had a very good sense of all of the all of the troops that were in, for example, um, Belgium and France before D-Day. So they had a good sense of that. They also went into great detail. Uh, this book went into great detail talking about different groups like the, the SS. Uh, there was, they learned more and more about how ruthless the SS was, but also how the, the, um, they, they were, how they were elite troops and they did just about everything in, in addition to um, being uh, in the combat zone, they, they like managed the, you know, the firefighters, they were, I mean, they essentially were everywhere. So it was, a, it probably, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go out on the limb here and I, and I'm going to say the red book might very well have been the most valuable piece that um, was available as a document for the allies for D-Day. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was, and, and many said that, I mean, I said that just, this was just a tremendously valuable piece for D-Day, but the next version, um, the 1945 version, the war was winding down. Uh, they knew that, but this became very, very useful, um, as, as German troops were begin at, you know, at the end of the war, when they were beginning to demobilize, they understood, you know, we should watch out for these guys, these are probably pretty bad guys and we need to deal with them. Or these are probably good guys and we should deal with them a different way. So right. the different versions of the red book was very, very valuable. Um, there was also a green book, which essentially was a, um, was the same thing for the Japanese side. And that was developed um, partly at Fort Hunt, mostly in London, uh, the MIS, MIRS office in London. Um, the gray book. There were, I can't remember all the different colors, yellow book, gray book. But yeah. they're also, one of the interesting things, I think, from MIRS was that um, they would they would stumble onto something occasionally that was very valuable. So Paul Fairbrook said that he, one of his jobs was to look at the, at the um, organization chart for the German army, which was very detailed, very precise. And one day he noticed that there was a new, a new box for a morale officer. And he mentioned it to his boss and his, his commander. And he said, you know, this, this looks very interesting. And the one wonderful thing I think about this was these, all these guys were very motivated and they needed very little supervision. So he said, you know, why don't you pursue this? Why don't you find out what this is all about? And um, so he found out that after the assassination attempt on Hitler, uh, they, there was a whole system set up to try to determine how loyal German officers and soldiers were to the, to the Third Reich, to the Nazis. And uh, he wrote a whole, a whole report on this. Uh, he got an award for it. But this is another thing. You know, they, they, they would find something. It looked really interesting. And they would, they would track it down and, and use it. We've touched on this, but um, some one thing that I found interesting is this is not a story that ends with the end of World War II because people are being brought here and interrogated after the war, and it's also kind of a Cold War story in a way too, isn't it? I mean, you sort of have the seeds of some intelligence operations and things that are going to go on for many years later that, that come out of interrogations at Fort Hunt at the end of the war. Yeah, this is a program called Operation Paperclip. And uh, this was after the war, um, the, both the, the Russians and the Americans were very interested in trying to recruit, uh, well, Americans recruit, the Russians in some cases actually kidnapped Germans that they thought were, would be it's valuable. It's a fine line between recruiting and kidnapping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, they... You know, um, especially scientists that seem to have value um, 
were brought to Fort Hunt, but the whole interrogation system became a little different. It was more like, um, well, you know, you're now in the United States and you should look at this and this and this, and this is the money we have and blah. It was, it was more like a, you know, they, they would make a pretty quick effort to try to determine whether or not they were, uh, would be loyal to the United States. Uh, and then it became mostly a sort of a recruitment pitch. And they, there were several soldiers um, who we, in, who we uh, interviewed who had the title of morale officer. Uh, they were really young. They were like, you know, just maybe in some cases, 18, 19 at the end of the war. Their job was to make sure the Germans were happy. <laughs> that, you know, yeah. we want you to stay in the United States. And so we want you to be happy and we want to do whatever we can to make you happy. And that's our job. We're morale officers. And some of these folks were former, um, were, were, were Jewish who had escaped from, uh, from, from Europe, from Germany and, and uh, Austria and other places. And some of them were really kind of annoyed that all of a sudden these horrible people um, who had tried to kill them and their families were now being treated like kings. Uh, and it's perfectly understandable that that's how they would feel. So, Chris, did you so, have a... Uh, look at, yeah, well, I just was curious, looking back now at the war, um, what was what did they think about their service or, or their experience? Because they certainly, uh, the people you talk about in the book had a somewhat unique wartime experience. Did they... What was their sense of what their unit had done, or how did they feel about what they had done? Um, you know, it, it's fast. That that to me is was one of the, the really, you know, I knew I I grew up. I, I'm old enough that I knew many, 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 many World War II veterans, even when I was young. Um, and a lot of them talked about what they did. Most of them didn't talk about what they did. Um, I had an uncle who actually flew with Jimmy Doolittle, and I didn't knew that until after, after he was gone. But uh, most because they were sworn to secrecy, because they didn't, they weren't allowed to talk about what they had done with anybody, including their families. They were pretty circumspect. Some of them opened up and were very, very, uh, you know, very revealing about what they did. Um, some of them sort of forgot a few, a few little details, which is fine. That would happen, um, but, but. Most of them were pretty, pretty open about uh, discussing what they had done once they were allowed to do so. But remember, they had 50 years, they weren't allowed to say anything. Right. Well, and a lot yeah. of times it was kind of your effort in the Park Service that almost got brought these guys together, wasn't it? It's not like they yes. could have reunions after the war because officially they didn't exist and nothing happened there, right? There was a big reunion. There was a small reunion in, nine, in 2006 and a much bigger one in right. 2007. You know, one one thing that I wanted to wanted to talk about that I think is is interesting, um, and I don't know whether you're going to talk about this or not, but at the time of this of this um, uh, reunion, 2007, the information about Iraq and especially Abu Ghraib and the way that Iraqi prisoners were being treated and tortured was common knowledge by then. And the fellows who were at Fort Hunt wanted to make it absolutely clear, <laughs> both in the interviews that we did and at this um, reunion that we sponsored, that they did not torture any German prisoners ever. Mm. And that, that to me was one of the most important parts of this whole story. They got tremendous information by treating them well. You know, like yeah. if you tell me something, I'll go buy you a steak dinner. If you tell me something, you know, we could keep playing ping pong or horseshoes or, you know, go swimming, go to movies. Um, and that was a very, very critical part of this story that they treated them well. Now, of course, there are going to be some Germans that don't want to talk. And that's the case in many, in many of these things. But they had a, a wonderful way to deal with that. Um, there were two Russian American soldiers at Fort Hunt, dressed in, in Russian uniforms. And so let's say a, a German was recalcitrant, didn't want to talk, say, I'm not going to tell you anything. Well, the, the result was this, this Russian would be in the room and they'd say, oh, you don't want to talk to us? 
How about Ivan here takes you to the Soviet Union? Maybe they would like to hear what you have to say. <laughs> and so we had our own version of we'll send you to the Russian front. Yeah. And that worked remarkably well. That that was a that was a great success at Fort Hunt. But I again, I... they, they wanted to make us understood that there was just no that they did not um, have any corporal punishment of any soldier. German soldier. Well and I, I... Yeah, and I found that, you know, given their background, um, or uh, their, a lot of their backgrounds, I found that very moving uh, part of the book that they were so insistent that, you know, that's not how they did, that how they operated. You know? Right. Um, I thought it was very interesting. There's a bunch of other questions that we'd like to ask, but we're running out of time. But uh, one question that uh, somebody asked us, actually uh, one of our guests asked early on in the show that I wanted to get to is... Um, is there anything left? Is there anything there that you can go and visit at uh, at Fort Hunt, um, uh, which is, I guess, a park now, um, that that will give you any sense of what went on there during World War II? No, <laughs> no, it's, no. After the war, after the war, don't um, take too long answering, Bob. Yeah, yeah. I've, I'm, I guess you got the message that we're running out of time. Uh, no, there, there, there's actually one. Um, um, there's one house that was actually built early on in the fort that's still there. The um, concrete gun batteries that were there as part of the Coast Artillery Fort when it was built around around 1900 are still there. Um, but mostly it's a big, large picnic area. Now, one thing the Park Service has done, which I think is terrific, they put up a monument to these folks and a, and a, um, a flagpole in the middle of the, of the fort. And there's some They've done some interpretive history there, but um, it's mostly mostly what was there just isn't there. And and part of the agreement was that the, the, the fort actually belonged to the Park Service before the war. And so they had to do an agreement with the Army um, to, to actually use this fort um, during the war. And the, and the agreement was they could use the fort for during the, the whole uh, World War II plus one year. Also, the agreement was whatever they built, they would have to tear down, and mm. so that uh, that's why it's a great lot for of the, preservation. Yeah. Um, I, Bob Sutton, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, uh, as I say, there's lots more we we could ask. Me, we might, we might email you a couple of questions that people put to us and ask you if you can you can give us answers to them. Uh, but so appreciate it. And your book, I want to just mention it again, is called Nazis on the Potomac, the Top Secret Intelligence Operation that Helped Win World War II. And I want to also mention, because uh, I think it's worth people knowing, that many of these uh, transcripts uh, are up on the uh, Internet as far to, part of the Fort Hunt Oral History Project. Uh, and we just put that link up on our page so that people can also access that and uh, take a look at the oral history. So thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you take Thanks, care. Thanks, Bob. You take too. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. And uh, uh, so we did, we, we, we'll, I saw a couple of questions there that I'd like to, I'd be interested in answers to. And, and one was concerning the Japanese equivalent, which there was, yep. there was one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, we'll try to get those to Bob and maybe put those answers up on our Facebook page. Um, and I want to mention uh, our show next week, Chris, because we're doing yes. one. It's you know. You and I will I, have lots of intense discussions next week. I Chris. I, I, I sense I sense <laughs> a, a already a, a bit of a bit of a conflict coming next week. We're going to jump back in time to that one subject that Chris and I can never agree about, the American Revolution. <laughs> the American War of Independence. I, I, uh, it's the, the, the most beautiful, uh, purest conflict in history. And yeah. our guest is Richard Middleton, who is the author of a new biography of Lord Corn Cornwallis. And uh, we know Cornwallis as the British commander who surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown. Can I mention that again, Chris? He surrendered. He fought, he fought valiantly till the end. Very Until the Royal Navy surrender just, to George Washington at Yorktown. Still, he decided to bring peace. Yeah, I'm well, no, sure. I'm not bitter about um, it at all. But but listen, but he, uh, you, you'd think after that that he would head home in disgrace. But in fact, in, in some ways, it's really kind of the beginning of Cornwallis's career, which goes on for another 20 years of uh, a soldiering and diplomacy, statesmanship. So it's very very and interesting. good it governance. Involves, it involves India 
and <laughs> Ireland, and uh, yeah, we another area that we can disagree on, and um, uh, and that was all that was all hearts and flowers in Ireland, but um, <laughs> not so much. Anyway, uh, we'll get the lowdown next week on uh, on Lord Cornwallis, and of course that's also going to be if any any of you are folks coming along on our uh, southern. Uh, our Revolutionary War Southern Theater Tour yes. the road to Yorktown and then we're going to be covering some of that ground in our interview next week so um, nice terrific to show today Chris it was fun I'm glad you, yes, you, you were able absolutely. to join us there from the, the town that I can never remember where you're staying in the hotel <laughs> the name of which I can never, Boy, I never call can but I know it. it's near yeah. Old Bourne so that's the, the main yes. thing close and, enough uh, thank you everybody for joining us today and, uh, thanks everyone yeah. be safe everybody thank you Thank <music> you.